Hello and welcome everyone to Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming and our Snacking in Space program today. So thank you so much for joining us. We are thrilled that you could tune in as we approach the July 4th weekend. Maybe you've got some fun plans coming up, maybe a barbecue. Well, I hope you are hungry, everyone, because today we are going to be embracing that festive spirit and talking a little bit about space food. So that is right, my friends. We are going to chat a little bit about the evolution of food up there in space from cubes and tubes all the way to shrimp cocktail and freshly baked cookies, both of which are actually pretty good things to take with you on a holiday picnic if you are so inclined. So my name is Alicia and I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York City. I'll be your host today. And just a quick reminder that the museum's live streams are free. And if you'd like to help us in supporting this content, please do click on the link that you can find in the comments or in the description below. Also, feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And also let us know maybe if you've ever been to the Intrepid before or if you plan on coming to visit sometime soon. July 4th weekend's a really good time to come. Now at the museum, our mission is to honor our heroes, educate the public, and inspire our youth. And if you are new to the Intrepid, well, here it is, right there. So we are located in a historic World War II aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. Now it was constructed in 1943, and it is now docked right off the shoreline of Manhattan on the Hudson River. So maybe you've visited before, or maybe you're looking forward to visiting us in the person uh, in person sometime in the future. But either way, if you are in the neighborhood, it is kind of hard to miss. So the Intrepid is so big that if you were to stand it up on its end, it would actually be taller than a New York City skyscraper. And it's so long that you could play almost three games of football on it at the exact same time. Now, our Intrepid served in three wars. It was World War II, the Cold War, and the Vietnam War. And then eventually it was retired back in 1974. And then a few years later in 1982, it was saved from the scrapyard and became the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. Sometimes visitors say, okay, you know, I know why you're a sea museum, right? You can see the, the ship right there. Uh, I know why you're an air museum too. You got a lot of airplanes there, but why are you a space museum? Well, let's recap, right? We are a sea museum. We are a naval ship. Uh, in fact, this giant artifact that you can see on display right here might bring that to life a little bit more for you. This is a propeller. In fact, it's one of the four that were on the Intrepid that spun around and pushed it through the water. But of course, there are a few other types of propellers too you might know of. Here's another type of propeller on the front of this plane. So this is part of the reason, of course, why we're an air museum. The Intrepid carried a number of airplanes. In fact, it could fit up to about 100 planes inside at a time. And it also had the ability to launch and land those planes, just like you might do at an airport. So it's basically like we say, it's a floating airport. Now, this plane is the Avenger from World War II. But also, later on, we had a lot of jet planes like this one, the Fury. And those were around later uh, during the Cold War. And they moved a lot faster. And we also even had things like helicopters, which were used to rescue people from the ocean as well. So, all right, clearly we are an air museum because we've got airplanes and we've got helicopters, but we're still not sure about space. Well, take a look at this. So does anyone know what this thing is? Let me know in the chat if you do. We are looking at this big black kind of almost light bulb shaped thing, right? It says United States on it. It's got a flag. Now, some people say it kind of even looks like an ice cream cone tilted on its side. Oh, we don't like it when that happens, right? You want to keep your ice cream up, up side like that. Um, but, you know, some people also say it looks maybe kind of like a megaphone. So you might be yelling into but this is actually quite a special vehicle. So this is something called a space capsule. And it's the thing that takes astronauts up into space. Now capsules ride on top of a rocket. The rocket, of course, is the thing that goes up into space. It's that thing you see lots of fire and smoke coming out of the bottom. But then once it gets up into space, the capsule separates off of the top of it. And then it is floating around in space. Now, why space? Well. Uh, in the 1960s, we were involved in, again, this Cold War going on. The Cold War era was happening. NASA, our space program, was at that time part of something called the Space Race. So we were in a race 
against a place called the Soviet Union, which is basically modern day Russia. Now, when you are in a race, there's always a finish line, right? And the ultimate finish line for this was to see which country could get all the way to the moon first. But of course, there's a number of steps that you have to take. You don't just roll out of bed and get to the moon, right? Uh, so we had to go through this process and do lots of experiments. In this whole process, you have to figure out how to launch, right? You got to figure out those rockets, all the flames coming out the bottom, all that fuel, how to construct these rockets to get you up into space. Then once you're there, you have to think about things like how to breathe up there because there's no oxygen unless you bring it with you. You also have to work and sleep over long periods of time if you're going to be traveling that far away. And then there's also things like docking with other spacecraft and landing on the moon, of course. And then, of course, it's going to take a little bit of time. You also need to think about things like eating. But we're going to get to that in just a second. So these capsules were part of those early steps, what they called Project Mercury, which was just to see if people could even reach outer space in the first place and survive up there for a while. Now, the thing you are looking at here is a replica of one of those early capsules called the Mercury Aurora 7. So take a look at this and let me know in the chat how many people do you think could fit inside of this capsule? All right, so take a close look at that. Let me know with a the number there in the chat if you do. And while you're doing that, I will also tell you that they decided to name it Project Mercury for a very specific reason. First of all, in Roman mythology, Mercury was the messenger god. So you could say he was kind of like their mailman. He was known for being really, really, really fast. Uh, he oftentimes is depicted with wings on his hat and wings on his shoes to help him go very fast. Uh, and it's also very fitting because planet Mercury, which was named after him, is also both our first planet closest to the sun and also, therefore, the fastest planet to orbit around the sun. So one year on Mercury takes only 88 days. Well, of course, here on Earth, 365 days is one year for us. So it only is 88 days for Mercury to have one year. So, of course, NASA wanted to be the first and the fastest to get to the moon. So they thought Mercury would be a great, great fit. So back to the Aurora 7 here. You can probably tell if anyone was guessing at home, this is not a very big spacecraft. In fact, it only held one full-grown man, one astronaut inside of it. So if you said one at home, you would be correct. Now, in 1962, the astronaut who went into space in the Aurora 7 was named Scott Carpenter. And here he is next to the Mercury Atlas rocket that actually took him up there to space. So Scott Carpenter was actually only up in outer space for about five hours. He was up there floating around for a bit before then safely splashing down into the Atlantic Ocean, which was how astronauts used to land back then. They figured that the water would be a nice kind of softer landing surface. Um, you don't want to land on someone's house or anything like that. Um, and then eventually they could go pick them up. But this is, th this is the idea here that if something this big, right, is going to land in the middle of the ocean... NASA still needs to go pick you up. You also don't want to leave your capsule just floating out there. Um, you can't just leave your astronauts floating out stranded in the middle of the ocean as well. So they would send a helicopter to rescue the astronauts. But when they got to the place where Scott Carpenter was supposed to be in this particular case, they couldn't find him. He wasn't there. And that is because he had, uh, while he was wrapping up his mission, gotten a little distracted. He was looking out the window. He was doing some experiments. And unfortunately, he fired his reentry thrusters two seconds too late. And as a result, he ended up splashing down over 200 miles off course from where he was supposed to be. Well, fortunately, eventually, they were able to track them down, but only after... He, lots of panic all across the evening news. Walter Cron Cronkite even said we might have lost an astronaut. Uh, everyone was very, very upset, but they found him and he was just fine. In fact, when they picked him up, one of the divers came swimming up to him and he just offered some of his food. He was just hanging out, taking a sun bath. So they picked him up. They flew him to the closest airport that was in the water. Hmm, a floating airport. What could that be? And as you can imagine, it just happened to be the Intrepid. So we accidentally got to be the prime recovery vessel for this particular NASA mission. 
but it's still pretty cool. So we like to talk about it. So here he is on board the ship, Scott Carpenter. These are some photos from our collection. There he is surrounded by officers and onlookers on board the Intrepid after being picked up in his capsule in 1962. So a very, very momentous occasion. And so ladies and gentlemen, this is the reason why we are a space museum. So the Intrepid played a very important role in retrieving astronauts and their capsules after they returned from outer space. So before we move on, um, I do want to see if we have any questions uh, about the space race or about our involvement there. Feel free to ask in the chat if you do. Uh, and while you're doing that, actually, before we get to our first question, I do want to point out something really neat in one of these photos um, on the right. And I'll actually make it a little bit bigger here for you, too. On the right. You can see Scott Carpenter walking around on uh, on the decks there. On the left, he's on the flight deck. He's in his shiny silver space suit. So slick. But on the right, you can see him looking a little more casual. And if you look very closely at his feet, he's wearing a pretty sweet pair of cons. Converse all-stars there. So see, even astronauts are just like us. They wear sneakers too. <laughs> all right. So let's see if we have any questions. Any questions at all? How long were the Mercury missions? So they were pretty short. Again, we just had to test out the water, so to speak, uh, and see if we could even figure out just how to sustain life up there before venturing out to the moon for, you know, two weeks at a time. Um, and this means, you know, thinking about everything, basic bodily functions. Uh, no one knew what microgravity would do to your body. And uh, there is actually a kind of a funny story I can tell you about our first American astronaut in space. His name was Alan Shepard. And uh, he was also the first to do something else uh, as well. So his mission was just about going up into space and coming back down again. The total trip was really just going to take something like 15 minutes. But the problem is, once he got into the capsule, he realized he had to go to the bathroom. But again, he figured, all right, you know, this is only going to be 15 minutes. Could probably hold it, right? Uh, but this was, of course, the first time that we had sent any American into space. So they had lots of delays. They wanted to make sure everything was just right. And they had so many of these delays, these hour-long delays then, that eventually it all stacked up. And he just couldn't hold it anymore. So he asked NASA for permission. And then he peed his pants. So they realized, though, this was kind of a... A helpful accident, I guess we could say, uh, they realized that they needed to think about stuff like that. They needed to think about how those astronauts were going to go to the bathroom over a period of weeks to get to the moon, right? And they invented these things that are eventually, you know, they're basically space diapers. <laughs> but um, of course, they call them something a little more, um, you know, important sounding. They called them maximum absorbency garments instead. So, but they basically were space diapers. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? How do astronauts get food and supplies in space? Yeah, so they have to take it with them. Uh, these early missions were very short, so uh, they could plan ahead and pack. But today on the International Space Station, they actually have a ton of food that they store up for them because, uh, you know, they're going to be staying up in space for long periods of time. So they get sent resupply capsules uh, and care packages all the time. And so they're able to um, get these, these care packages and stock up while they're up there on the ISS. Um, so they have to, you know, now as we're thinking about going back to the moon and eventually going on to Mars, they're really starting to think about how they can have these long duration things and cut down on the weight of all the things that they're bringing with them. Which actually brings me to the next sort of things that we're going to be talking about here, which is, of course, the food. So I mentioned, everyone, that our earliest space missions had a lot of experiments, right? So again, these were just baby steps. We needed to test everything out just to make sure this is even a good idea in the first place to be going to the moon. Uh, and, um, you know, one of those things that they really experimented with, of course, was space food. Now, throughout history, explorers have always had to deal with the availability of food or lack thereof uh, while they were on long expeditions, wherever it was that they were going. So maybe they uh, you know, were on a boat or maybe they were on a camel in the desert or hiking through the wilderness or you know, even in a capsule in space, right? But the idea of getting nutrition so that you didn't develop something like scurvy, let's say if you were a sailor on a ship, and also had enough for a long period of time because those journeys, let's face it, could last a while. Uh, but then also, as I kind of mentioned before, they didn't weigh too much to burden you down. Well, these have always been issues that they have to consider. 
Now, very early on, we discovered that food could be edible for longer periods of time if, of course, you dried it out. And often people would cut up things like meat or fish or fruit into strips and then dry them out in the sun. Uh, and of course, we still eat things like that, dried fruits and beef jerky, stuff like that. Uh, but a little later on, we also developed the idea of curing or rubbing things with salt to preserve it. Uh, and of course, also freezing things to make it last longer. And of course, canning as well, which many people were doing while we were stuck at home over the past year. Uh, but not all these storage solutions work really well for things like space flight, because up there you have limitations to weight and also volume, so the amount of space that it takes up. And if you think about, you know, you're adding a lot of food weight, they also have to think about that in terms of compensating with the amount of rocket fuel and rocket power that they're going to need to launch you to. So they've got to think about things like packaging as well. Um, in a microgravity environment, you've got things that are floating around. And until relatively more recently, also the lack of refrigeration. Uh, and that's, of course, where the genius of the people at NASA came in. So early on in the space program, even before we sent anyone into space for the first time in the Mercury missions then, uh, there were actually some concerns about the ability to even do things like swallowing in a microgravity environment, and even being able to do things like digesting and absorbing the food into your body once you ate it. And they didn't know what would happen to your body if you know everything's floating around, well, Maybe your body can't even move everything through it in your system like it's supposed to for you to absorb it, too. So they were also concerned then with uh, how to prepare food, too. So thinking about things like how temperatures might affect it or air pressure or the lack thereof in space. And uh, even things like, you know, the subtle vibrations that were felt inside of the capsules. They just didn't have any idea what to expect and of course, they also had to consider the additional weight of all this food on board in those teeny tiny little capsules, which as you just saw, we only had one person in the Mercury ones. Now, in the earliest days of the space program, during Project Mercury, our flights really only ranged from a few minutes to about a day. So they didn't really need too much food. And often they even started off by eating here on the ground first before going into space. So this photo that you're looking at here is of John Glenn having breakfast in the morning of his first historic Mercury flight, where he became the first American to orbit the Earth, and that means going around it. And this has really become a tradition now for the astronauts to have one last big meal here on Earth before their mission. Uh, hopefully they, you know, go to the bathroom beforehand, though, too. Um, now, because once those early astronauts would go up then, they would do a lot of food testing on those flights as well. So simple activities, though, those early missions like chewing or drinking and swallowing, making sure that could work, uh, both solid and liquid foods while in microgravity. So the earliest food systems used on the Mercury flights were similar to military survival rations or even what hikers might take on a long trip. They had to provide a lot of nutrition in a very small container. So John Glenn was America's first man to eat in space as well. And in this picture, you can see a tube. It kind of looks like a, like a toothpaste tube there with a straw coming out of it floating right next to him on the left. He's kind of looking at it like, what is this? And it does look a little strange, right? Well, on that historic mission, he had applesauce in a tube that you can see on the left. They saved that magical tube there. And he also had pureed beef and vegetables from the tube on the right. So he did say that he found it pretty easy to eat in microgravity. That's good. But he also complained that he felt the menu was a little too limited. He was joking, of course. Now, everyone, as we go through this history of space food today, I do want you to pay very careful attention in particular to the beef and vegetables, okay? So that has historically been a pretty popular meal over the years. So you are actually going to be able to track how it progresses through these photographs as we move through time. So just make a mental note. You're looking at that picture on the right there, beef and vegetables from a toothpaste tube. <laughs> okay, but... Um, those first Mercury astronauts found themselves you know, eating this thick pureed paste that they would either suck through a straw or just squeeze into their mouths from those toothpaste like aluminum tubes there. Um, on the, the left, we have bananas and clam chowder on the right. Oh, yeah, in a tube, uh, as well as dehydrated and compressed bite sized cubes of food on the side there as well. 
And here is some more actually to give you an idea of this dehydrated stuff. So on the right side uh, on top, we've got some bread substitute bites that to me kind of just look like croutons. So that's not so bad. Uh, although if that's, you know, all you're eating, it's kind of dry in your mouth there. Also some cookies and chocolate wafers in cubes and some apricot bites. And also in the rest of this photo, a number of dehydrated powders that could be reconstituted or kind of brought back to life with water, just kind of like, um, like a pudding mix that you might have. Now on the top row, we've got chicken, cocoa and grape nuts in dehydrated milk there. And then on the bottom, there's also banana pudding, beef and gravy, and some juices. Yeah, so little baggies of uh, powdered questionable food there. Now here is another photo of some dehydrated mercury foods. We've got some strawberries on the top left, pears on the top right. We've also got mushroom soup on the bottom and wait for it, beef and vegetables. All right. So now we have graduated, thank goodness, from pureed goo in a tube to a freeze dried log. Mmm, delicious. <laughs> Now, this photo shows the mechanism for connecting a water dispenser to the food containers that I just showed you. Each portion of food was individually packaged in those flexible, transparent little plastic pouches, those little baggies, and it had a water injection port. Then after the water was injected into the package uh, from a pouch there that they had brought on board, then it got kneaded up and then all the water was mixed in and then it was squeezed out to eat kind of like gogurt. So you can actually see uh, this astronaut here sucking through that little plastic kind of straw tube thing coming out of <laughs> this little bag. And Vashson says, ah, does not seem tasty. Yeah, yeah. So some of the astronauts felt the same way, Vash. <laughs> uh, but overall, yeah, it wasn't very appetizing. Um, they also kept running into problems when they tried to rehydrate the powders at that stage. They didn't always work right. But fortunately, the Mercury missions weren't that long anyway. So food was ultimately less essential at that point for survival. So they weren't relying on this food to survive. Uh, now, I mentioned that the Intrepid picked up the Aurora 7 capsule, but that was actually not the only capsule that we picked up. We also picked up this one. So the next series of missions were the Gemini missions, and these were named Gemini after the constellation of Gemini, the twins. Maybe some of you out there are Gemini yourself, your zodiac sign. Uh, but they named it this very fittingly because now this was the first time that NASA sent two astronauts up into space together inside of this capsule, as you can see here. So it was a little bit bigger than the Mercury capsule that we just looked at. And on board the Gemini 3 mission, we had Gus Grissom and John Young, who you can see standing there on the right in those shiny, awesome spacesuits too. Uh, so these two astronauts went into outer space. They also orbited around the Earth a few times. And then they also splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean. And here is a picture of the Intrepid actually retrieving the Gemini capsule from the ocean in 1965. I love this photograph, all those sailors lined up along the side there, ready to pick them up. Uh, there's that yellow floaty around the capsule too as they help to retrieve it and bring it on board. But some of the later Gemini missions were much longer, up to two weeks long, in fact. So this was when some major advancements in space food were born. So NASA teamed up with the Whirlpool Corporation, that's the company that makes, you know, refrigerators and washing machines and stuff like that, as well as the Army, because they had been making survival rations for years already to this point. Good idea to pair up with them. And they developed new food and new packaging. And the first thing to go, of course, were those aluminum squeeze tubes. First of all, they were just gross, but also the metal tubes themselves actually weighed more than the food inside of them. So again, talking about this weight restrictions and how we had to think about that and trying to think of how we can conserve all of that fuel as long as we can to get to the moon. That was really important. We didn't want to have to carry around all of this extra metal tubes. Yeah, yay, no more metal tubes, says Vashsen. Excellent. So NASA knew that they, uh, if they weren't packaged properly, foods that were floating around in microgravity, uh, it could really damage equipment. Or even worse, it could even be inhaled by the astronauts. So they then actually worked also with the Pillsbury Company, you might have heard of them, uh, to develop an edible gelatin layer that went around the foods in order to reduce the crumbling of all of this dehydrated food that was compressed into little cubes. <laughs> uh, and so these foods 
were uh, also vacuum sealed into these individual plastic pouches um, for easy storage and, you know, just being able to pull them out and eat them that way. Uh, and what you are looking at here are uh, is a date fruitcake, brownies, apricot cereal, and strawberry cubes. So we've progressed a little bit. We are no longer, you know, squeezing it out of toothpaste tubes. But again, now covering already dehydrated cubes with a gelatin layer still doesn't sound super amazing. I see in the chat, maybe that sounds kind of amazing. Eh, maybe, maybe, maybe you think so. I still don't really think so, though. And I'll say, too, some of the astronauts didn't think so either. Um, there's actually an infamous story that we do like to tell at the Intrepid about the Gemini 3 mission in 1965, which was, again, one of the missions that the Intrepid picked up. So, um, again, on board Gemini 3, there were two astronauts, Gus Grissom and John Young. And one of the experiments that they were tasked with on their five-hour mission was to sample two meal packages. So this that you are looking at here is actually one of them. So in it, it had dehydrated beef pot roast, orange juice, toasted bread cubes, bacon and egg bites, and a wet wipe. Now, obviously, they weren't supposed to eat the wet the wet wipe there. Um, well, two days before the launch, fellow astronaut and practical joker Wally Shara stopped by this place called Wolfie's Restaurant and Sandwich Shop in Cocoa Beach, Florida, nearby Cape Kennedy, where they were. So he picked up a corned beef sandwich, and right before the launch, he gave it to John Young as a joke. Well, John Young kept that sandwich, and in fact, he smuggled it up with him into space by hiding it in his spacesuit. And once they got into orbit, he pulled out that corned beef sandwich, and he took a bite. He even offered some to his friend Gus up there. And they ate the first corned beef sandwich in space. Now, that sounds great, but there is a slight problem here. If you eat a sandwich here on Earth and you've got crumbs, well, of course, we've got gravity. So everything just goes down onto the floor, under your lap, right? But in space, eh, they're going to float everywhere, right? And that is exactly what happened. Now, that is actually incredibly dangerous because like I said, those crumbs could have gotten lodged in their equipment or worse, one of them could have inhaled them. So of course, they very quickly realized it was a bad idea. They put it away. But NASA had heard every word of their conversation and they got in a lot of trouble when they got back home. Now, they didn't lose their jobs, but they did have to publicly apologize to Congress, who was furious with them, as you can imagine, because they're wasting all this time and this money, and they weren't eating all this fancy experimental food that they had been sent up there with in the first place. But, kind of like Alan Shepard, they actually also helped NASA to think a little more about this issue of crumbs and other types of food that maybe they should or shouldn't take up into space on those early flights. So now, everyone, if an astronaut wants to eat a sandwich in space, they can't use bread. Instead, they use tortillas because they are flat packed and they don't really make crumbs the same way that we do with bread. Now, you're probably looking at this picture wondering, what is this? What are we looking at right here? Well, this is actually a tribute to that infamous corned beef sandwich. It is an actual sandwich that has been memorialized in resin at the Gus Grissom Memorial Museum in Indiana. So Congress may not have thought it was very funny, but our friends at that museum certainly did. So shout out to the Gus Grissom Memorial Museum for doing that, because it's just great and it's fun to look at. It's a wonderful story that we do love to tell. Now, almost two decades later, John Young, who was floating upside down here on the left, became the first commander of the space shuttle which of course is very special to us. We have the very first prototype orbiter. You can see right behind me here, the Enterprise. Um, but at that point, you know, the food had progressed quite a bit. Now we're at the space shuttle uh, stage here. So you know what he actually ate for lunch in space? Corned beef, all properly irradiated and sealed this time. But he thought that'd be a very fitting meal to be eating uh, in honor of uh, <laughs> that historic flight on Gemini 3. But back to Gemini, everyone, water was actually produced on board the Gemini missions as a byproduct of fuel cell operation and could be injected with this little hose that you see. So this kind of just add water, dehydrated food, it really gave them a lot more options and it really cut down on the weight of having to bring the extra water up with them. So in this picture, you can get a sense of what it looked like at mealtime. Still not really that appetizing, but uh, you've got strawberry cubes that you just popped in your mouth. 
And the beef is now there reconstituted in that bag with water. Now, some of the other food that was flown on later Gemini missions were things like cinnamon toasted bread cubes, not too bad, uh, chocolate cubes, cream of chicken soup, uh, turkey and gravy, and even shrimp cocktail. Now, as very, very popular, actually, with the astronauts, too. Now, as time went on, they made a number of additional changes, mainly because they realized that the food wasn't as nutritionally balanced as they wanted. And also, the food preparation took a lot of time and effort. And sometimes the meals themselves just didn't taste great because, well, the water that they were using from their fuel cells, it also had dissolved gases in it. So also, uh, maybe not really the cleanest thing to be eating either. Tastes a little funny as well. Uh, and also, again, still sometimes just things just didn't reconstitute and come back to life properly at the time. So this kind of brings us up now to the Gemini era, right before we get to Apollo, which was the big ones when they're going to the moon. Uh, but I want to pause here one more time and see if we've got uh, any questions. Any questions? How do astronauts eat when they are in their spacesuits on spacewalks? Right. So the astronaut suits um, do actually have pouches for water with straws that they can drink from. Uh, and even these little snack bar things, they're kind of like, um, if you've ever had like a power bar before, it's this little thing that's in their helmets of their suits that they can just sort of lean into to eat, just sort of by leaning. Um, because of course they can't use their hands. Their hands are out here and they've got their helmet and can't pop open that because then they can't breathe. Uh, so it all has to be reachable just by leaning their heads in order to take a sip of something or to, um, you know, take a nibble of something. Um, but of course, for the most part, if you were going to be in your space, you probably want to make sure you take care of all of that as much as you can prior to being out there. Uh, but if you are, you know, out on a spacewalk for a long period of time, sometimes you get thirsty, sometimes you get hungry. And that's how they do it. Good question, though. Any other questions? Do astronauts get to pick their own food when they go into space? Uh, so starting around the Gemini missions that we just talked about, they could start to pick their own food. Um, they did have a standard menu, but they were able to swap things out and pick off of a list of foods a la carte. Uh, and in fact, uh, as I, I just mentioned here, one of the most popular dishes was shrimp cocktail. Um, and I'll tell you, it's actually because of the shrimp cocktail sauce. So when you go into space, uh, you're in, of course, microgravity and that feeling, we, we like to say it's kind of like if you've ever been on a roller coaster, you know, where, when you're going down, that feeling that you're always falling, it's all the time. And so as a result, all the fluids in your body are also going to start to shift around a bit. And a lot of it goes into your head and also your nasal passages. So, um, you know, if you've ever had that feeling when you've had a cold um, where, you know, you're just kind of stuffed up. That's what astronauts report it sort of feeling like. Um, and when that happens, you can't really taste flavor as well. You've probably been there. Um, and so your taste buds do get affected by that thing. It's fluid shift. So astronauts apparently really do love spicy foods because they're able to better taste them. That's why we love spicy foods when we are sick and congested, right? You can actually taste something. Um, maybe it helps to clear up your nasal passages too. Um, so uh, of course the cocktail sauce uh, with all that horseradish in it, uh, it's very spicy and tangy. So astronauts really do love their shrimp cocktail. Um, but <laughs> yeah, as you can see this picture right here, this is what it looks like in its dehydrated form in a little plastic pouch. Um, not the most appetizing. Although if you've ever bought, you know, frozen shrimp and you, know, you have it in your freezer, it kind of looks like that, I guess, before you cook it. It's, yeah. Anyway, uh, so shrimp cocktail, it is a big hit with the astronauts. It looks a little bit less appetizing. Now, by the time of the Apollo program, everyone, the quality and the variety of food increased even further. And the first Apollo mission, Apollo 7, um, had 96 food items available, too. So there was a whole smorgasbord of food that they could choose from. Um, the Apollo astronauts were actually also the first to have hot water cleaner this time, which made uh, rehydrating the foods much easier, also improved the taste since it wasn't just going to be room temperature or cold all of the time. Uh, and some of the earlier packages were those uh, plastic tube pouches that they would eat out of, but eventually a number of foods were changed to this new spoon bowl package that you can see in these images. So this on the left is chicken and rice that flew on Apollo 11. And you can see it is a plastic container that could be hydrated through a valve on one side. It's opened um, on the top there with a zip top. 
And then its contents were actually eaten out of the top with a spoon, just like a bowl. So on the right, same idea there, uh, labeled as spiced fruit cereal, and it's also got dehydrated milk powder in it. So if I had to guess, this is probably uh, basically Apple Jacks and milk for breakfast there. So you can just open that up and eat it out of the tub. And then, of course, we can see um, our Apollo progression of, hope you were paying attention, none other than beef with vegetables. It is still a dehydrated log at first, but now once they add the hot water to it, there you go. Now they can eat it with a spoon instead of slurping it out with a straw. <laughs> I want a space burrito now, someone says in the chat. Nice. Yeah, so it looks you know, a little bit more like you might uh, you might eat it uh, normally, beef with vegetables, like a beef stew. And, you know, what I always say is it's all going to the same place. So just close your eyes. It works. <laughs> also, incidentally, in case you were wondering, the first NASA meal eaten on the moon consisted of bacon bars, peaches, sugar cookie cubes, coffee, and a pineapple grapefruit drink. Now, some of the other foods consumed on Apollo were coffee, cheese crackers, uh, sausage patties, scrambled eggs, peanut cubes, tuna salad, spaghetti and meat sauce, beef pot roast, and even, as you can see all these pictures here, but even, here we go, hot dogs all sealed up and irradiated to protect them from growing bacteria. So they started to think ahead. They started to think about how they could, you know, go a little bit further with their food, um, as well as, you know, actually going a little further towards the moon there. Uh, but they were thinking about how they can make things last longer, how they could irradiate food in order to um, prevent spoilage over time, and uh, be able to make sure that things even taste good as well. Um, and uh, Piano Chen, I see in the chat, you say, if astronauts can taste spice in space, can they taste salt in space? Yeah, everyone can taste like they normally would. You, your taste buds don't go away. They're just a lot more muted um, because of that fluid shift. And eventually you do get used to it. But yeah, the stronger tasting foods, I would imagine if you have something that's very, very salty or very, very spicy, those are the things that are going to probably be a little more popular um, because you can taste it a little bit better. Now, with the later shuttle missions, and largely through today, actually, the food looks a little bit more normal. Here are a few of the different types. So we still have rehydratable foods. So these are freeze dried, and all of the water has been removed. So things like soups and scrambled eggs. But we also have these things called intermediate moisture foods. So these are things that have some water in it. So these are foods like dried fruits, like apricots, uh, and then also natural form foods is the other type, which um, are things that just already naturally have a long shelf like. So you've got things like nuts and candies and condiments. Um, and then you also have these thermostabilized food. So again, like the hot dogs, they have been exposed to heat to kill bacteria. Um, and it's also things like canned foods and uh, even pudding cups, believe it or not. Now, I know we've covered a ton of food so far, but really, everyone, I know you all really are just thinking about one particular space food and you're thinking to yourself, okay, where's the astronaut ice cream, right? Look at this. I've got a package right here. Where is this stuff? Why are you talking about this stuff? It's this wacko idea of food and space. It's become such a novelty that this is all that people think about because it is so very popular in gift shops. And so, you know, just chalky and weird to eat. And I remember as a kid, just absolutely loving this stuff. I couldn't get enough of it. It's just so out of this world, literally, right? Like this is just bonkers to be eating something like this. But everyone, I do have a very terrible, terrible secret to tell you. Astronaut ice cream and ice cream sandwiches, at least like this stuff, never went into space. I know. The main reason really actually is just that the astronauts didn't like it. But also, you know, if you've ever opened up a package of this stuff, it's messy. It's crumbly, right? It is it is just everywhere. It's, it's a powdery. It just, I've never opened a package and it's all, always been in one piece. You know, it's always in a million pieces. And remember that is a disaster in microgravity, right? Let's think about that corned beef sandwich. Now, freeze-dried ice cream cubes were originally developed for early Apollo missions by Whirlpool, but they never made it on board. And there was actually one press release about the Apollo 7 mission that listed vanilla ice cream as a dessert aboard the ship. 
But Walt Cunningham, who was the sole surviving astronaut from that mission at the time that he gave this interview, he confirmed numerous times that ice cream was never actually on the menu. But I will say this, in 2006, a freezer was flown aboard the space shuttle to store some research samples. So they sent them up with the real thing. They had some of those individually portioned ice cream cups. They put them in that freezer because they figured, all right, if they're going to be sending it up anyway, they might as well just go ahead and do this. So they sent them up with those little tiny, you know, single portion ice cream cups. And they had finally ice cream in space. <laughs> So everyone, I want to thank you so much for tuning in today, for snacking in space. I hope you learned something cool. Um, and I do want to see if we have any final questions as we round out the program today. Any last burning questions? Why did NASA break up the plan to go to the moon into missions? So again, it's this idea of baby steps, right? We had to just make sure that we could even go into space without exploding, right? We didn't know what would happen to our bodies. Like I said, we didn't know if we could swallow or breathe or do anything that we take for granted here on Earth. So that's what Mercury was all about. We like to say if you break up the missions into like the life stages of a human, that is baby mode, okay? That is where you are literally in diapers, right? And you are just learning how to eat uh, baby food out of tubes, right? That was the baby steps. Then we have Gemini. Now you're maybe like a toddler. So you're starting to eat a little bit more, you know, solid food, which we kind of talked about today. Um, now you're making friends, right? We've got two people in that capsule. Um, you're learning how to walk. So that's also the era where we first did our first space walks. Um, and you're also, you know, you're, you're learning how to maybe build things also with your toys and connect things and, and connect with other people. So that's what we like to think of as um, docking in space as well when we were docking with the Agena target vehicle. Then you get to Apollo. Now you are a reckless teenager. Now you've taken the car out for a road trip and we're going all the way to the moon. Um, and so we're a little more advanced there. But they broke it up just so that we could make some progress. We tried something. It worked. All right, let's kind of innovate on that go a little further until eventually we were able to get to the moon. And we're still doing the same thing today with our latest missions. You know, we are constantly working and reworking what we're doing, seeing what works good, what could we do to improve it. And eventually, hopefully that will take us back to the moon and on to Mars and who knows where else out into the universe. So that's why they broke it up into those little missions like that. Uh, any other questions? Can they make their own food in space now? So actually, yes, they have successfully grown vegetables in space. Um, and this has been a long time thing that they've been studying, the effects of microgravity and solar radiation on growing plants and vegetables and things like that. Um, because of course, NASA someday wants to send people to Mars um, and also you know, living maybe long term on the moon too. And so that's gonna be this really important idea of um, hydroponic planting. So when you take a plant and you put it in nutrient dense water, um, but without soil, because Martian soil is very, very different than what we have here on Earth and isn't going to necessarily sustain um, vegetables and, and plants the way that it can here. Um, so it is going to be different. Plants can grow in just water. Uh, and also even in outer space, hydroponics. So, um, so far we've grown lettuce and tomatoes and potatoes. Um, so definitely, yes, if, you know, if you're into salads, hey, you are good to go. But most of the rest of it is brought up. Um, but I will add that earlier this year, for the first time, this isn't actually making food from scratch, I'll say, but they did actually for the first time bake cookies in space. Uh, so the Doubletree Hotel actually sponsored this really fun experiment where they sent up chocolate chip cookie dough um, and also a zero G oven that was designed to work in space. But what's really interesting is that they had to experiment on the bake times for the cookies and they found the sweet spot. So normally if you bake cookies, you know, you, you don't leave it in longer than like 20 minutes, let's say, if you don't put your cookies on a sheet. Um, they found the sweet spot for eventually baking them was leaving them in for two hours. So either that zero G oven was calibrated really incorrectly, or maybe, you know, microgravity does something to the way that things bake and the way that those chemical reactions happen in space too. So they're testing, they're experimenting, they're learning, they're reiterating, and uh, they're baking cookies in space too. So they're gonna have to keep testing that out, but um, it was a really interesting experiment. And also if you ever saw pictures of it, uh, they actually had to weight down the cookie dough as well. Because if you think about it, you put it in the oven and the cookies are still gonna float around inside the oven too. So they had these 
I think they were maybe silicone or maybe, um, and they had little weights on them. It kind of held them down closer to the tray as well so that they didn't float around. They looked a little messy coming out, but if you've ever had those double tree cookies, they are delicious. All right, my friends. So if you do have any other questions about our programs, feel free to reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through any of our social media. I would like to thank you all so much for watching and sharing your questions and comments today. Be sure to follow or subscribe to this channel and visit our website for our upcoming programs. And our next family program is actually going to be next week on Tuesday at 3 p.m. We are taking Thursday off. We'll be back with you on Tuesday at 3 p.m. It is going to be celebrations at sea. So we are going to be picking up with our festive July 4th spirit on uh, over the weekend and then meeting up with you again on Tuesday the 6th with a program about some of the traditions and celebrations that happened right on board ships like the Intrepid while sailing off at sea. So you're gonna learn some connections to maybe what you already celebrate in your own communities, as well as discover a few other fun ones. So join us next week on Tuesday at 3 p.m. for our next Intrepid adventure, Celebrations at Sea. And also just as a very exciting reminder, our museum has reopened to the public seven days a week. So we would love for you to come by and visit us 10 to 5 p.m. all seven days of the week. Uh, so yeah, if you are in the area, come on by, check out some of the cool things that we have on display like that Mercury capsule or like our space shuttle enterprise you can see behind me there. We'd love to have you. So once again, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Hopefully we will see you online for another upcoming Intrepid Adventure. Thanks so much, everyone. See you next time.